Dr. Satish, our senior consultant, Department of Nephrology. He is going to educate all of us on uh, how do we receive <coughs> nephro emergencies and how do we handle them before we refer them to a tertiary care center. Over to you, sir. So I have given this topic, nef uh, emergencies in nephrology. In fact, when it comes to nephrology, you know, uh, so if I start talking about all the emergencies, there's a lot. I'll just try briefly talk about, uh, um, I'll just, uh, my outline will be a few points about acute kidney injury. I'm just going to highlight that's all. And a little bit go fast also, because I've been asked to finish my talk in 15 to 20 minutes. So hypokalemia, then hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and uh, acute palmedema. I'll just highlight a few things about all these things. So, but when it comes to AK high, we don't call it this anymore as acute renal failure. We use the word for acute kidney injury because uh, ARF and CRF we no longer use. We use acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. So AK high, we just have to know what is AK high. Should we wait for the creatinine to go high, like 1.5 to 2.53? No, we don't go by that. In any high ICU setting or anywhere, we just go by hourly urine output. So we look at, you know, if somebody is passing less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 6 to 12 hours, even though the creatinine is around 0.8 or 1, they come under stage 1 of AKI. Stage 2 is around 0.5 ml per kg, again for more than 12 hours becomes uh, stage 2 AKI. And stage 3 is, you know, for more than 24 hours or anuria. Along with that, also to add on to that, okay, if there is jump in creatinine, it's fine. More than 0.3 uh, per deciliter from the baseline, 1.5 to 1.9 times the baseline, or 2 to 2.9 times the baseline, or more than 3 times. But more than this, don't wait for the creatinine. To diagnose AKI, we don't need the creatinine to go high. We go by hourly urine output. So we measure hourly urine output, and based on that, we'll take a call whether the patient has AKI and act accordingly. So it comes as AKI. So we have, you all know, we have pre-renal, intrinsic, what we call as acute tubular necrosis, the renal tubules gets affected. Nephron has something called the glomerulus, then the renal tubules, and the, then the collecting duct. So we're talking about pre-renal. Well, there's dehydration, all these things causes pre renal. Then intrinsic is something which damages the renal tubules and the post renal because of obstruction. So, pre renal can be because of hypovolemia, GI loss, anything, whatever is the cause, diarrhea, anything, decreased cardiac output in cardiorenal syndrome, decrease in EF is less. They always have decreased cardiac, cardiac output because 20% of the cardiac output you need for the kidneys to function normally. Anything less than that, always, you know, they go for cardiorenal syndrome. Then any decrease effective circulating volume in congestive heart failure, liver failure, or any whatever happens whenever God has given us something called renal autoregulation. But this autoregulation can be blocked if you take uh, NSID. So even one dose of NSID can, can block the prostaglandins because pro prostaglandins help in autoregulation. So that's the reason some people may not have any renal failure, but some people can go for renal failure with just one single dose of any painkiller. Even COX-2, any, anything is a painkiller. It's just not uh, brufen or ibuprofen. A lot of people think COX-2 inhibitors are safe. COX-2 inhibitors only safe gastric irritation is less. Otherwise, all are painkillers. So try to avoid all these things. And elderly, elderly people, you know, the GFR will be very, very less. So we have to take it with a pinch of salt when you give any painkiller. So make sure because the GFR is already low, when you give a painkiller, naturally you're going to block the prostaglandins again, they go, they're prone for AKI. So what is intrinsic? When this prenatal, if you're not treated, if this prolongs a certain time, then what happens is the renal tubules get affected. That is called as going to ATN. So yet the glomerulus can get affected or the renal tubules can get affected or even the vascular problem. Glomerulus is what you call as acute glomerulonephritis. It can be rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, what you call as RPRF. So vasculitis, anything can cause glomerular injury. Tubules, it can be ischemia. As I told you, prolonged, you know, if you don't treat the pre-renal and prolonged ischemia, low blood pressure, renal hypoperfusion, because whatever is the cause, that can cause ischemia and again cause acute tubular necrosis. Or any sepsis, most common thing in ICU setting is sepsis causing into AKI or prolonged ATN. Then vascular. Vascularis, as I told you, that can cause or any malignant hypertension, axillary hypertension, all those skin can cause problem and cause acute kidney injury. Or HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome or thrombotic, thrombotic purpura. So these drugs also we have to be worried about the contrast, any aminoglycosides, amphotericin B or any, you know, myeloma, rhabdomyolysis, all these things can cause AKI. Normally aminoglycosides, it's not going to happen immediately. So when you give aminoglycosides, what happens is that normally go to the lysosomes, stay in the lysosome for longer time. So it takes some time for renal failure to set in. It's not like today I gave amikacin 500 and tomorrow I'm going to see a creatinine going high. So normally when you give aminoglycosides, normally we should wait for 3-4 days, sometimes you see renal failure setting in. So be careful whenever you give aminoglycosides, make sure that you monitor creatinine at least once in 48 hours at least. So what are the frequent causes I told you, ATN is around 45%, prenatal is 21% in hospital setting. Then we have something called acute and chronic, a lot of people will have chronic kidney disease, where because of some acute setting will have acute and chronic kidney disease, that amounts to 13%. Then you have obstruction because of uh, blood order obstruction that normally older men with prostatic diseases. 
Then we have global nephritis of aspirin around 4 percent, acute intestinal nephritis around 2 percent, any drugs can cause AIN, antibiotics can cause AIN or any painkiller, there is lot of drug, any drug can cause, even paracetamol, any drug can cause acute interstitial nephritis, it's very difficult to prove unless we do a renal biopsy. So, AIN is one thing, any cause pantoprazole, lot of case reports you have read, pantoprazole causing lot of renal failure, all comes under acute interstitial nephritis or any other embolic, any cholesterol embolism, any post angiogram, all those things can cause acute kidney injury. So, presenting symptoms, you have diminished kidney function, when you have, whenever you have diminished kidney function like edema, hypertension and decreased urine output as usual and any renal failure is prolonged or uremia, then only you will have weakness, fatigability, anorexia, vomiting or change in mental status or, or seizures. Along with that associated symptoms when you have, it helps us in diagnosis, SLE or lupus like any fever, arthralgia or any pulmonary lesions, any systemic disease, any vascular disease, all those things will lead to any associated symptoms will lead to vascular disease. People coming with flank pain and oliguria, anuria always rule out any obstruction, renal infarction or infection. They should have pain, fever or any decreased urine output. Anuria, if when there is bilateral obstruction or severe shock, only then the patient will be anuric. Otherwise, patient will pass urine at least 100 to 400 ml of urine that is called oliguria. So, treatment, main thing is any AKI first clinical examination. Clinical assessment is the most important thing. Look for volume status, whether the patient is dehydrated, clinically uolemic or clinically depleted, volume depletion or hypervolemic. That is very important. Look for all the signs, you know, JVP, all the heart sounds, they see anything else is there. So, any go by clinical examination that is very, very important. If somebody clinical volume status is dry, then try to fill them up. You know, that is the most important part in any AKI is just you have to give a lot of fluids and make sure that you hydrate them very, very early. So, identify volume status is very, very crucial for us. Then you look at what is the cause. Whatever is the cause I mentioned, look into the cause and then try to look at the cause and try to eliminate the cause for AKI. Until you look at the cause and eliminate, you are not going to solve the problem. So, as I told you fluid resuscitation and urgent imaging only to root any bladder outlet obstruction. So, treatment whenever a patient is admitted, make sure close monitoring of intake output, hourly urine output chart is very important. Do not delay in getting a nephro consult if the patient remains oliguric for long time or as any proteinuria or microscopic hematuria. So, this when if somebody has a proteinuria, microscopic hematuria and not passing urine, first thing comes as RPGM, rapidly progressive globular nephritis or uh, vasculitis is the most common, but do not delay when somebody is oliguric also. So, relieve obstruction in case of bladder water obstruction, a simple folius catheter in case of BPH is more than enough. And any early initiation of dialysis in case of persistent oliguria or acidosis. So, nowadays dialysis we do not wait for creatinine as I told you to become urea becoming 150 or 200 or creatinine becoming 5 or 6. We just go by hourly urine output in ICU if the output is less than early initiation of dialysis is a must. The more you delay you know the more acidosis patient has the more complications the patient is going to land. So, early initiation of dialysis based on urine output and ABG is, is the best thing to do. We should not hesitate for renal biopsy in patients with any unexplained renal failure. Somebody who comes suddenly with 5 or 6 creatinine, then we should not uh, wait to look at. So, we do a lot of renal biopsies and in case unexplained renal failure, we just have to do renal biopsy to find out the cause and treat immediately. There is something, this is a normal kidney, what it looks like. So, mild, you can look at the dilatation of the pelvic ecclesia system. This is in somewhere in moderate adenophrosis. In severe, it is a gross dilatation. Whatever is the cause, it is a gross thing. Okay. So, probably Shahid, my friend will uh, and colleague will talk about more in uh, emergencies in neurology later on. So, let me come to hypokalemia. What is hypokalemia? Potassium being less than 3.5 is the tell us hypokalemia. So, what happens in hypokalemia? A lot of the hypokalemia is very bad. When you look at the ECG, you look at classical, we have lowering and broadening of the T wave happens. Okay. Then slightly there will be a later on there will be a prolonged uh, QT interval. So, this is uh, ECG changes what we see commonly in hypokalemia. You do not see commonly in all mild hypokalemia. So, in severe hypokalemia only we can see ECG changes unless you look for it because otherwise you just miss around, uh, miss, miss around uh, lowering and broadening of T waves and uh, the prolonged QT interval. So, what happens in hypokalemia if you are not treated? So, you will have severe cardiac arrhythmias, respiratory failure and hepatic encephalopathy. So, people with older patients or patients with heart diseases, patients on digoxin and patients on arrhythmic drugs, they are all prone for arrhythmias. So, what is potassium loss? So, when you talk about potassium, you know it is around 3.5 to 5 is a normal range. When somebody's potassium, you know it is around 3.5, it is not normal. So, how much you think is a potassium loss? It is just not around 10 or 12, 20 or 30 milliequivalents. When somebody's potassium is around 3, there is a potassium deficit around 125 to 250 milliequivalents in a 70 kg. So, this is a replacement you have to do it. 
So, in case of potassium is around 3, the replay the, the loss is around 150 to 400 milli equivalents. In case it is around 2.5, it is around 300 to 600. With 2, two potassium, it is around 500 to 750. So, these are the losses we have to replace it when you look at the number here. So, we just not, just not giving pot chlor of 10 ml 3 times a day or 20 ml 3, time, 3 times a day will not going to help you in any way. So, we have to look at the replacing the losses, whatever potassium losses is happening. So, first step in what we do is identify again, stop ongoing losses of potassium. If somebody is using diuretics or laxative, please stop that. Use in case you still need a laxative, still need a diuretic, use a potassium sparing diuretic like spironolactone if diuretic therapy is required. Treat diarrhea or vomiting if somebody has and use H2 blocker to decrease any if somebody has a nasogastric suction loss, try to use these drugs or control hyperglycemia if glucosuria is present. So, second step, then you have to replace either orally or IV. Oral potassium, we know it comes as pot flow. So, every 15 ml, you know, 15 ml comes as 20 mL equivalents. So, as I told you, you can give 20 ml 3 times a day or 6 hourly, you know, but normally this, you know, pot flow when you give I dose, it cause severe GI irritation. You can mix it with fruit juices. Commonly, if the patient is okay, you can mix it with fruit juices and then they can drink. Tablets is not available in India, but otherwise, you know, ADK is available. It, it gives us a 90 mL equivalents per 750 mg of tablet, but stick on to pot flow. But make sure that how you keep pot flow depends on the losses, how much of losses has happened. So, it is very readily absorbed. Large doses can be given safely. Only thing is, lot of GI effect. That is the reason we ask them to take it with uh, fruit juices, they may feel better. If somebody has renal tubular acidosis, also we replace with potassium citrate. And always, and liberally, you know, always. This is the only time we tell them to eat a lot of fruits. Otherwise, nephrologists you always stick on to don't eat, tender, don't take tender coconut, don't have a lot of fruits. And so, otherwise, this is the time we use liberally, you can have a lot of fruits. So, IV, how do we give IV? You know, when you have a life threatening condition, we need to give IV. As I told you, you know, take a ampule of potassium. So, normally, don't, if you are having a peripheral line, don't give potassium very fast, don't use peripheral line for a longer time. It is always dangerous. So, but if you have a peripheral line, what you do is in case you want to give, you think for somebody's potassium is around 3, you want to give IV potassium. Try adding, you know, around uh, 40 mL equivalents. You can add it in 100 ml saline or 500 ml bottle. But ma what I do is, what I recommend is, you add around 40 mL equivalents in 100 ml normal saline and you give it around 5 to 6 hours. Because if at all in peripheral line, don't make sure you don't give potassium IV more than 6 to 8 mL equivalents per hour. That means if you add 40 mL equivalents in 100 ml, so, you give it over 5 hours. So, 100 divided by 5, it is 8 milli equivalents per hour. So, giving 8 milli equivalents per hour, that is quite safe in a peripheral line. Okay, so that is very simple. I, I concentration, if you use, you know, around 60 milli equivalents, also what happens is severe phlebitis. Severe phlebitis. So, make sure you, when you are using a peripheral vein, use a broader cannula and also make sure you do not add more than 40 milli equivalents in 100 ml saline and give it over 5 hours, a very safe way of giving. And please avoid glucose containing fluid because again, there will be shift, again, you can have hypokalemia. So, in emergence, as I told you, same thing, take 100 ml back, use 40 ml equivalents, ideal in potassium of 3 or something like that, 5 to 6. But whereas you need potassium is around 2, 2.5, where we need to give a lot of IV potassium, better to give central line. In central, you can give up to 10 to 50 ml equivalents. Like, like same thing you can give, if you are doing, if you add 80 ml equivalents or you can give up to 20 ml or 25 ml per hour. So, up to 10 to 15 ml equivalents per hour you can give, only in a central line. But stick on to 6 to 8 ml equivalents in peripheral line. Okay, infuse always with a larger central vein. I have written a femoral because in emergency it is very easy to insert a femoral. Jugular also, femoral, whatever central line is quite okay.